Okay, I have started recording. Can someone confirm that I'm recording? Yes. Beautiful. Okay, welcome everyone to week five, just before the break, which is going to be lovely. Um, today we got it. We've actually got not. It's quite light today. We've got more of the kind of social subjects. So we have some HKS, some HEP, some mom. Mom gets. It's kind of starting to get a bit more complicated. And ethics. This is really a prelude to law, so it's not too intense. Anatomy is also quite, um, it's quite a lot. It's a bit hard, but Jono will walk you through that nice and easily. So um, might get started quite soon. And yeah, I hope you enjoy. Slides will be published as soon as we finish and it will go on a YouTube channel, depending on how good my internet is. That will be today or tomorrow. So let's go. This is our yield system you might recognize. Top right corner, you'll see something telling you the yield, hopefully. Start, get started. All right, I'm starting off with HEP for today. Um, I think it's my first time like properly presenting to you guys, so I'm pretty excited about it. All right, David, next slide. Um, so we're doing the stress and mind body medicine today, hopefully. Um, pretty much, unfortunately, none of this is really that high yield. There's like two facts you sort of have to know and that they don't really pop up on the exams, but it's more like a fundamental overlay for it. All right, next slide. Perfect. Um, so the way I structured this was going through just the learning objectives in the like presentations and PowerPoints and lectures. Um, so hopefully if you guys are running low on time for lectures, I'd recommend just going through this. Don't even bother necessarily watching some of the HEP lectures. They can be quite long and not really that useful compared to like some of your other lectures. Um, so the first learning objective was to understand the role of mental health in the burden of disease. Um, the key thing here is if you can see on the graph on like the right hand side, you have um, that first column is pretty much a mental health problem and like the other problems are down there um, and you can see how the bar chart is the tallest and that's for um, disability adjusted life years so what they want you to get out of this particular dot point is that mental health is a huge problem in terms of disability adjusted life years so it's not going to be the number one leading cause of death or even like number two or number three those are like more your physical problems but what it is going to be like the number one leading cause of is this idea of burden of illness. So like the fact that people usually get a mental health problem quite young and then they live like 40 or 50 years with that mental health problem means that those 40 or 50 years, um, they're like a burden on the system. So it's like a disease burden and like their life for those next you know, 40 or 50 years isn't like it's the same. So that's why we call it disability adjusted life years. So that's like a really important concept in mental health. It's not necessarily going to cause like everyone's deaths, um, but it does impact their quality of life. Um, the next learning objectives is just some definitions for you. Uh, you'll find this in mom as well. Um, they pretty much just want you to understand the difference between stress and anxiety. The main one here is that stress is usually to do with like a stressor. So like exams coming up, you're worried about the exams because that's a stressor. Um, whereas anxiety, it's usually a little bit more general, like you don't really know what you're anxious about. It's like more of an just feeling uncomfortable or scared or worried in general. And it's usually about something in the future. So you're feeling uneasy about like next week, but you don't know why. Like you can't say for sure you have an exam coming up. That's why you're stressed. It's more of like a general feeling. All right, next slide. Okay, so for those of you who did Psych 3-4, um, good on you, because that's this is a lot of Psych 3-4. Um, I'll pretend, though, that you haven't, so I'm going to explain this as if um, we're going from the very start. Um, pretty much our, like, nervous system, as you can see in the right-hand diagram, is, like, organized in a couple of ways. You have the central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. Um, central, because that's sort of, like in the middle and all the signals go there um, and then what we have we have what you call your peripheral nervous system so that's like the nervous system like in your arms and legs like on the outside um, the peripheral nervous system can be split up into two you have the somatic and the autonomic and then the autonomic can be split up into two 
you have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Um, so autonomic is just your automatic system. And um, when it comes to stress, we're mainly talking about that sympathetic part. So pretty much the sympathetic nervous system is what initiates the body's stress response. Um, so on, you see that like there's a little diagram there about the different organs. Um, pretty much what they want you to know is maybe know like one or two examples of like what happens or you, your body does when it's stressed to like particular organs. And it's pretty much anything to do with survival. Um, so like your heart, when you're stressed, your heart starts beating faster because it's like David needs to run away from the tiger. So the heart's being really fast. So he has enough oxygen going around, enough glucose to run away from the tiger. Um, or the blood's diverted to your muscles because David needs to run away from the tiger. Um, or your pupils dilate because David needs to see where he's running when he runs away from the tiger. Um, so the, the bottom line here is your mind can't differentiate between an exam or running away from a tiger. It'll give the exact same physiological response. And I just want you to know a couple. So that's the sympathetic nervous system, anything to do with survival. Uh, it turns on the survival stuff in terms of the non-survival stuff. So for instance, um, usually your digestion stops when you're stressed because that's not important when you're running away from the tiger to digest food. You want to send the like blood to the muscles. Um, and then the parasympathetic system, this is just important to know because it counterbalances the sympathetic. So if the sympathetic dilates your pupils, so you can see more, the parasympathetic system contracts it. If it's sympathetic um, stops digestion, parasympathetic starts digestion, just counterbalances it. All right, next slide. You would make me get attacked by the tiger. I would. I'm sorry, David. <laughs> you have to run is the, is the outcome. Or go with someone who's slower than you and sacrifice them. I'd rather get eaten than run, but I like the sacrifice. <laughs> okay, okay. Sounds good. We'll, Are you we'll volunteering? Organize. No, but we'll find someone, I'm sure. Um, this is just an example of how stress has different effects on the body, on your mental health, and your lifestyle. Um, these are more fun facts that what they really want you to do is understand that when you have a lot of stress, it's bad. So that's called an allostatic load. Um, so being stressed about one exam, that's okay. Um, if you've been stressed every single week about like an assessment you have every single week, um, that gets bad because it's like the accumulative process of the stress. Um, but some fun facts, Monday mornings are generally stressful. Um, and they found more people have heart attacks. On Monday mornings because it's stressful. Um, also, if you're sick, um, you your like stress responses are impacted. Um, so you're more likely even to get sick if you're stressed. I think it's something about six times more likely to get sick. Um, and when you are stressed, it lasts for 72 hours. So like if you accidentally got, I don't know, scared because you almost like hit a car or something, um, the effects on your body will last for another, like, th three days, which is crazy. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, pretty much they just want you to know that stress does cause mental health problems, does cause cognitive decline. And then, uh, um, specifically, you're more likely to get Alzheimer's. So that's a big one associated with stress. It's like the main disease they'll go for. And that's because um, certain parts of your brain start breaking down. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that when you're stressed, your amygdala, amygdala that's the, like the emotional part of your brain, gets a little bit larger. Um, so that means that the next time you're stressed, you have like more of an emotional part. So you get a little bit more stressed than you would. And you get more and more and more stressed. It's like a positive feedback loop. It just keeps coming back and you get more and more stressed. All right, next one. Um, this is part of also mum for this week. So I didn't include this in um, mum slides, but I included it here. Um, what they want you to just realise, which sort of makes intuitive sense, um, is that you need a little bit of stress to perform like optimally. So up here is you guys acing your exams, which I'm sure you will. And it's like low to medium levels of stress. Because the thing is, if you're not stressed at all, like you're just sitting down and you're like, oh, it's a calm Tuesday morning. 
um you're not even gonna like want to do your exam like you're not gonna really do it you're probably not gonna sit there for the whole three hours um you'll probably be sick of it by the time he gets to it um so that's why you need like a little bit of stress to not be sleeping and to be a little bit more than alert um but too much stress is when your mind starts like racing around um so that's just a graph that they do want you to know but it's pretty self-explanatory that's it david and that's pretty much your first lecture done the second lecture for this week is on mindfulness um this is related to the hip prac that you guys will have as well we have to write down the journal and like how you practice mindfulness um so it's once again it's pretty straightforward but there are like two sort of concepts i want you to get out of this one all right david um so the first concept that uh, they love to talk, tell us about is this idea of the default brain or the attentive brain. Pretty much the default brain is bad. The attentive brain is good. Um, the default brain is this idea that what your brain would be like if you just left your brain on a desert island and you didn't do anything with it. Um, so generally it's just related to survival like it'll make sure everything's still beating, still breathing, but it's also going to be distracted um, ruminating, so like dwelling on bad or negative thoughts, um, worrying. It's usually associated with like either recalling the past, like thinking, oh, what went wrong last week, or like worried about the future. Um, whereas the attentive brain is the idea that mindfulness helps cause your attentive brain. So mindfulness is like when you're focusing on the present or a present task, and that's exactly what the attentive brain does. Yep, David. Nice. Um, in comparison, uh, scientists have decided we now not only have the default brain and the intensive brain, we also have an online brain. And this is pretty much the modern brain of the 21st century. Um, what's really important here is that because we're online, we're always seeing constant streams of information. You've seen a lot more than if you like were in the olden days, you had to get out like an encyclopedia, like it'd be a lot less information coming your way. Um, so this means that our attention span has drastically decreased. Um, so right now, according to studies, our current attention span is seven to eight seconds, which is like really pathetic. So that means by the time I said that sentence, you've already like switched to another thing and then switched back to me. So seven to eight seconds, which is officially less than a goldfish. And like goldfishes are like fish. I like they have a better memory than us, better attention. So anyway, fun fact, but that also it can come up. I've seen it in one of the practice questions. So there you go, seven to eight seconds. Um, same with uh, social cognition. The online brain has been a little bit impacted because you don't see like people's bodily cues as well online. So your ability to like interpret it isn't great. And like your idea of like what's real and not real online can be skewed. All right next oh and also sorry really important thing um multitasking this will come up in another lecture um later on in the year but this is a question they do ask on exams and that's the idea that multitasking isn't actually a thing and uh, we can't like do two tasks simultaneously you can just do one task and then really 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 quickly switch to the other task so like talking and driving is like me switching from talking to driving back to talking like really, really quickly. Um, so just keep in mind multitasking as in doing two things at, or more at the same time is not a thing. All right, David, next one. Um, awesome. For mindfulness and attention, we generally say there are three like stages. Um, the first is you need to realize where your attention is. It's so, like right now you're thinking about what a nice day it is outside. Um, secondly, to prioritize your attention where it needs to be, like back to this PowerPoint and about how bad our attention is. And thirdly, for the attention to stay there. So trying to make sure that it stays concentrated on said PowerPoint. Um, and we do that through mindfulness. And there are sort of three ways that you'll be introduced to throughout the rest of the sem. Um, the first way is like a formal practice that's so like literally sitting down, maybe having like smiling minds or something, playing and like listening, like doing the breathing exercises. Um, the second is an informal practice, so that's just more like at any given moment thinking, oh no, I have to make sure my attention is given to this task. Like I have to make sure right now I'm sitting down to I know, write an essay, I have to make sure my attention's there. Um, and then the third is cognitive practices. 
And these are like more like changing the way you're thinking. And there's generally four. So the first is perception. So making sure what you're seeing is actually like what's happening, like in reality. Um, second is letting go. So if you had like mistakes, regrets, relationship breakups, and making sure to let that go. Um, third is acceptance. So just go in with whatever is in the moment. And lastly is presence of mind. And that's the whole mindfulness idea of being in the moment. Go, David. Yes. Um, this learning objective is largely very much self-explanatory, but they love to hone in on the fact that mindfulness is good. Mindfulness helps doctors and students make less mistakes, gives them a less chance of burning out at work, um, higher emotional intelligence. In a few slides, I have examples of what emotional intelligence is and to be more social. So if people aren't as social, as they usually are, maybe they need to practice some mindfulness. Yeah, next one, David. Um, and that's an example on the table of the right of what emotional intelligence is, in case you're curious. Because we always hear about like IQ, but I don't think we ever hear about EI. Um, now this first one is actually a fact you need to know. It came up in our practice exams, not our actual exam, um, but in our practice exams for year one, um, you have to realize that at age 50, those who meditated um, are seven and a half years younger, like brain-wise, than those who didn't. Um, seven and a half years is the number you have to know, and 50. Um, interestingly enough, for those who practice mindfulness, um, they uh, their pain intensity is reduced by 27%. Um, so what that means is that if they put like their hand in a cold bucket, they actually physically felt a quarter less pain like there was a quarter less signals going to the brain um but it also was reduced by 44 percent emotionally so that means all of those signals go into the brain which is already less um even less of that was actually interpreted as pain as pain so it's like if they just kept on thinking it doesn't actually hurt it doesn't actually hurt um it actually didn't hurt for them um and then sleep obviously those who practice mindfulness sleep better Uh, let me clear this. Um, now I have just some true or false questions. Um, type it answers in the chat, guys. So the first one, anxiety is a state or a response of worry or uneasiness about something in the future. True or false? Hey, yes, completely right. Something in the future. Thank you, Daniel. Um, as opposed to stress, which is like something specifically and usually something now. All right. Secondly, stress involves both physiological and psychological components. Didn't really talk about this one, but uh, take a guess, guys. It's physiological, so processes happen in the body, and psychological in the mind. Yes. Oh, yes, Daniel. I got an answer. He said true. I love it. All right. Uh, third question. Mental health issues is the leading cause of death. Yes, well done. It's not, it's the leading cause of disability adjusted life years. So it does like the burden on the health system, it's the leading cause, but in terms of death specifically, it is not. All right, number four, mindfulness can be practiced informally. Yes, brilliant. We have formal and informal and cognitive. So informally, definitely. That's just making sure you're attentive in the moment. And number five, our at average attention span is around 20 seconds. Yeah, unfortunately, I wish that was true. As it turns out, we're just goldfishes. We're worse than goldfishes. It's more like seven to eight. All right. Thanks, David. Um, thank Katja. That was really, really great. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I like how you did the learning objectives we should consider doing that. Ethics and med law. So I'm doing ethical issues in doctor-patient relationships. I've made three slides because I believe this is a Zoom lesson and it's also more to kind of prep you for your assignment. It will be done in more detail in med law, which we'll cover as well. So this is kind of more of an intro. Um, the first, there's three concepts you need to understand. The first concept is something called informed consent. 
informed consent has kind of three parameters. There are three requirements. For informed consent, a patient needs to have capacity. They need to have, have made a voluntary decision and that decision must be informed. Okay, now what do those words mean? Firstly, capacity means someone can understand the information. They can remember the information. They can demonstrate that they're weighing the information, the pros and cons, and then they can communicate their decision. Okay, so um, whereas a voluntary decision is just a decision that's made freely. This means there's no pressure, coercion, or manipulation from the person providing health care. The final um, component was that it must be informed. That means the patient must be given understandable, clear, and accurate information about treatment and care. Um, what's most important is the patient must understand the information. So it's not just enough to tell them. You have to make sure that they understand it. And a good way to test that is for them to repeat back to you what you said or to summarize it which you'll go over in your social history taking sometimes. So those are three important concepts. Remember, capacity, voluntary decision, informed. If you want to, it's lower yield. Remember the components of capacity. Understand, remember, way, communicate. Um, consent can be given in a variety of ways. It can be implied, oral, or written. And often the invasiveness and risk of a procedure determines the level of consent required. So for example, an invasive surgery will, offer written, will often require written consent. Whereas maybe if you take someone's pulse, if they just give you out their wrist, that's considered implied consent. Might a typo there. I'm so upset with myself, but I'll fix it, I promise. Then you have um, confidentiality. First, we should differentiate the difference between privacy and confidentiality. Privacy is the handling of personal information. It's regulated by laws and is a right in Australia. And it is more about individual ownership of their personal information and they can choose how their information is used. So it's kind of, it's different to confidentiality because privacy is you get to own how your information is used and distributed. Whereas confidentiality is about the protection of patient information that is discussed in confidence. It's more under common law, so it's more broad. There are a few examples of when a doctor can break confidentiality. This include when a patient consents, drunk drivers, child abuse, and infectious diseases. These, the reason why the last three is because they prove um, they like have a significant burden on the well-being of the community and the immediate safety to those people around the people who are breaking these laws, these ethical considerations. Final slide is about paternalism. Medical paternalism is when a doctor decides treatment for a patient and of, often it will um, be either against directly opposing the patient's desires or the patient won't be able to make a decision. So the doctor decides treatment for the patient. There are two types of paternalism. Strong paternalism is overriding someone's informed and voluntary decision who has determined capacity, who has demonstrated capacity. An example of this is in Australia, you're required to wear seatbelts by law. So even if someone is completely informed on the risks and benefits, they've made a voluntary decision without any manipulation or coercion, and they have capacity to understand and to convey to you the understanding, they still have to wear seatbelts even if they don't want to. So a medical example is that someone, this is in an episode of Scrubs, so someone with capacity makes a voluntary and informed decision to refuse dialysis. They understand the risks and benefits for themselves. And although it will be a life-saving intervention in this case, it would be unethical and inappropriate for a doctor to provide dialysis in spite of the patient's decision. If a doctor were to provide dialysis, it would be strong paternalism as the patient is has made it voluntary informed and has capacity to make this decision. Weak paternalism is different. This is when the patient cannot demonstrate their choices are voluntary and well-informed and may not be able to demonstrate their capacity. For example, if they're unconscious or maybe if they're children. And in this case, the doctor may intervene in the presumed best interest of the patient. Now we've got some questions. Which is not one of the three main components of informed consent? A, confidentiality, B, capacity, C, voluntary, D, informed. Chuck it in the chat. A, correct, good job. I, uh, the answer is shown. I don't know if I showed it before, but thank you for the answer. Next question. Laws requiring the use of helmets on motorcycles are considered A, weak paternalism, B, manipulation, C, strong paternalism, D, virtue ethics. 
see. Yeah, exactly. Strong paternalism. Great job. We should just say with Katya that also, um, Andrew, I think, made this point that anxiety is disproportionate to the stimulus. Katya, is that correct? Is that an important? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Andrew, for picking that up. Yeah. So, guys, just remember it's often, exam it's often um, in exams that anxiety is a disproportional response to the stimulus. So now I'll hand it over. Awesome. Thanks, David. Um, all right. This mom section is going to be quite short. There are pretty much three-ish parts. Um, David, next slide. Um, the first part is just defining behavior. And then the second part is classical conditioning. And the third part is operant conditioning. It's like how do you control behavior? Um, for the definition of behavior, pretty straightforward. All we have is the actions or reactions in response to a situation. Um, actions because usually behavior is like doing something but even like reactions for instance like laughing is like a behavior um, and that's like not really an action it's like more like a reaction to something uh, so actions or reactions in response to a situation um, unfortunately the point they really want to hone down here is that you can change behavior uh, but often patients like when we see them won't be likely to change behavior in the way we need them to. Um, so down below you, there's a list of five diseases. You don't have to know these, but you just have to like appreciate it. Um, these five diseases and in brackets, you have the like changeable factors. So for instance, heart disease, smoking, you can get patients to stop smoking um, or like taking I know, less cholesterol or exercising more. Uh, but the reality is by far most of our patients like won't do that. Um, and I just want you to appreciate that even though behavior can be like changed and it can be influenced by learning, it's really hard to get people to change it. All right, next slide. Um, so the first like type of conditioning you have to know is classical conditioning. So there's two classical and operant. Um, the main things, yeah, thanks, David. So factors that can be changed are called modifiable risk factors. So like there's factors like age, you can't like change age, so you can't modify it. Um, for classical conditioning, it was created by Pavlov and his experiment with dogs. So if you're ever bored, just type Pavlov and dogs in YouTube, and there are some pretty cool videos that come out. Basically what he did is he said that if you connected like something with something else that could like cause a behavior change um so what he did first is before conditioning he was like if i give dogs a like treat like i don't know is that a bone or something or is that a cookie let's say he gave them a cookie if i give dogs a cookie um they'll start salivating so that cookie um in this case is called an unconditioned stimulus unconditioned because this is like in normal circumstances without conditioning if I give a dog a cookie the dog will start salivating because it needs to like get the enzymes to process the cookie um, so salivating is the unconditioned response now what Pavlov did is he's like let's make something else um, which will later be called the conditioned stimulus um, <laughs> thank you um, let's make something else uh, which will be called the conditioned stimulus uh, later on, now the neutral stimulus connected to that cookie. Um, so for Pavlov, it was a bell. It was like he rings the bell, then he gives the dog a cookie. Um, so over time, like the more, the more he did it, the dog's like pretty smart. It like realizes that the bell's connected to the cookie. And then the dog starts salivating just when you ring the bell. It's like just the bell by itself causes the salivation. Whereas, like, normally, if I was to go up to, like, any random dog right now and, like, ring a bell, the dog does nothing, like, because, like, why would it? Uh, but because it started, like, putting these two stimuluses so close together, the dog in its brain started associating it. And the really important thing here is that that's not voluntarily. So, like, it can't stop salivating when it hears a bell. It just automatically does it. So the dog's very passive in this. It's just waiting for its cookie, and it's not voluntary. Um, so, um, at first, the bell is called a neutral stimulus when you're just trying to like introduce it to the dog, but then after conditioning, it's called a conditioned stimulus. Um, so that's when, if you just ring the bell alone, the dog starts salivating. 
Um, so before it was called the unconditioned response because salivating was normal to a cookie. Now, even if I take away the cookie, the dog still salivates. So that's called a conditioned response because salivating to a bell is like not normal. Like normal dogs don't do that. I mean, I don't have dogs, but like that would be weird if I did have a dog and it did start like salivating. Um, so that's classical conditioning. Um, next slide. Um, this slide is more just like an example for you guys. If you want to have like some good definitions in your notes. Uh, here are just definitions of neutral stimulus, unconditioned stimulus, and conditioned stimulus. And an example of like this is how like the diagram usually works. So you can do this with anything. Um, so like there are like lots of other examples. Like there's an example of like rats in a cage, like they do something similar. Um, or like yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example later on. I'm just trying to think of a fun example with David, but nothing's coming at the top of my head. So we'll move on to operant. Um, next one, David. So um, classical conditioning, the one we did before, is involuntary and the learner is passive. They just start salivating like automatically. For operant, it's voluntary. So the learner actually has to do something. Um, and the like response isn't automatic. They can like choose their response. Um, in operant condition, we organize it in three ways. Um, it's called the ABC, so antecedent, behavior, and consequence. Antecedent is just any stimulus, like, I know, it's cold outside, that's an antecedent. David has uni homework, that's an antecedent. Um, behavior is like, it's cold outside, so I put on a jacket. So putting on a jacket is a behavior. David his behavior in this case was procrastinating his homework because he wanted to do a swim marathon because David loves swimming and loves marathons. Um, so he didn't do his homework. That's the behavior. Um, and then the consequence is what happens because of that behavior. So we have anatomy on Mondays. So poor David rocked up after the weekend on class on Monday and was very stressed and anxious. Um, or like the behavior, if I put on my jacket, for instance, is I'm no longer cold. So that's a consequence, no longer being cold. All right, now the really, really important thing here and why I called it high yield is that our consequences um, can be like organized in like four ways. And this table below are like the four ways. So the, the four ways are we can have positive punishment, negative punishment, um, positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. <laughs> so um, positive is when I give you something. Okay, that's why it's positive. Um, reinforcement is if I want to increase the likelihood of the behavior happening. And punishment is if I want to decrease the likelihood of the behavior happening. But positive is me giving you something. Um, so in this case, for instance, David had positive punishment. Positive because he didn't do his homework and he got feelings of stress. It's like getting something, like feelings of stress is positive. Or if you want to like do a different scenario and like reframe it differently, it could be negative punishment when he doesn't know the answer um, and his gold star was taken away. Um, so the fact that he got something taken away is negative. So positive, if I give you something, like I give David detention, that's positive. Or negative, if I take away David's playtime. Punishment uh, means that David's unlikely to repeat that behavior. So here the behavior was he procrastinated. So it's punishment because he's not going to repeat it. Um, alternatively, like with the example of me putting on a coat, let's say I put on a coat and I got warmer. That's positive because I got warmer. That's a getting thing. And it's positive reinforcement because I'm more likely to put on my coat when I'm cold. Um, so super, super important. This comes up on your exams. Just think, are you giving the person something or are you taking away something? Positive, negative. And are you like making that behavior more likely to happen? That's reinforcement. Or are you making sure the behavior doesn't happen? That's punishment. Um, so super important. Make sure you got that concepts down. All right. Um, next one, David. Um, this is just a comparison between classical and operant. Um, the main thing here is that classical is involuntary. The dog can't choose whether to salivate when he hears the bell. It just does it automatically. 
Whereas operant ba David still, despite, I don't know, getting a detention, can still decide not to do his homework. So it's still a choice. It's still voluntary. Um, and also the learner is passive in classical, but the learner is active in operant. So the learner has a choice. Um, those are the two main differences you need to know. Um, but there's a list of like all the differences. Um, awesome, next slide. Oh, brilliant. Um, we're just up to two questions. Um, the first question, what is the definition of behavior? Um, any, any guesses in the chat, guys? There are, there are multiple definitions here to read to, but I reckon you've got this. Yes, perfect. Perfect, Daniel. The actions and reactions or reactions. So remember, behavior isn't necessarily always what we do. It's sometimes how we react. Like we start crying at a funeral. That's a reaction. And next question, David. Um, which of the following statements is true about operant and slash or classical condition? Um, I'll give you a little bit to read through it, maybe like 10 seconds. Also, something I realized when I was doing my practice exams for um, year one is um, start, <laughs> this is gonna give the answer away, that's okay. Start like, when, they, when there's like questions like which is true or which is not true, um, start from the bottom and work your way up because it's like very much more likely to be from the bottom than it is from the top. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, so negative reinforcement is taking away chores. Taking away means it's negative, and if you take away their chores, like that's a good thing. Like no one wants to vacuum clean. So that means you're, that's like reinforcing the behavior. It's like encouraging that behavior because they're taking away a bad thing. Um, so yeah, it is, it is D. All right. Um, that answers just the next slide. And that is it for mom. Okay. Can you maybe talk about why the other ones are wrong? Just yeah, good idea. Um, so in operant conditioning, the learner is passive. Um, that's wrong because the learner is active because they have to like actually do stuff like they have to do a behavior and they have to like think about the consequences and classical conditioning the learner is active that's false because the learner is it's quite passive um, the dog just like salivates when he's the bell it's no choice anymore um, oh I see I see why um, so we had a few answer in B and um, that is a fair that's a fair answer um, the reason it's incorrect is that technically there isn't like an outcome in classical conditioning. Um, so like it's more of an outcome. Maybe consequence wasn't the right word, like result. Um, so I'll I'll take that under advice. I'll change this in the slides I upload. I'll put out the result. Because um, you're right, technically consequence is a term used for operant conditioning. We don't usually say consequences in classical. Um, but consequences here, we just mean an outcome, like the dog does salivate. Um, and positive punishment, so positive is if you're giving something. So if you gave a detention, that would be an example of positive punishment. But taking away something, taking away lunchtime, would be negative punishment because you're taking it away. Oh, but yeah, thanks, David. Okay, so now on to HKS. Um, this week we're covering Indigenous. So, next slide. <coughs> Um, I believe you guys will have a compulsory model to complete um, about how to um, talk to Aboriginal patients, how to treat them, the differences in culture, and it's compulsory, so you'll have to do it. And it's basically all you really need to know. So I really strongly recommend you going through that carefully. But yeah, um, in this week, you'll be talking about how, how can you be identified as Aboriginal? Because um, nowadays it's really hard to see anyone that's just been kind of like you could say pure but like to someone who's actually only had aboriginal descent and we'll see why that's the case but because of that there's different things you need to be kind of like ticked off to be considered as aboriginal Torres Strait Islander that's what ATSI stands for so you need to be a descent of them but also you need to identify yourself as an aboriginal Torres Strait Islander but also you have to be accepted by the as a by I buy the um, community. So basically looks can never determine Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander status. Um, all those three has to be considered. Um, 
Yeah, and Aboriginal people really have a strong connection with the country, language and people. And this is how they communicate. And it's very, very important that you understand the differences in culture and how they go about their things as well. And um, you'll learn this in clean skills as well, but you always, always have to ask about Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander status for every patient who comes in, no matter how they look. Okay, why? Because you can never determine someone by their looks. So next slide. So um, there's this really big gap in Australia between Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders and the non-Indigenous people. And one of them is life expectancy. So this is a stat we had last year. So the Indigenous males have roughly 11.5 years lower life expectancy compared to non-Indigenous people. And for the females, it's 9.7 years lower than non-Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders. And generally over the years, um, the life expectancy for both males and females for Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders have increased, but we all kind of increased together. So there's still this big gap between the non-Indigenous people and the Indigenous people. So that's really something that we should be um, thinking about. Also, the government has been trying to tackle, but hasn't really been able to yet. Um, also, there are very prominent issues, health issues within the community that includes diabetes, heart diseases, trauma, cancer, TB, HIV, and all these different diseases. And one thing that we had to do last year was talk about kidney dialysis and disease. And just a note that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have up to seven times more, um, like are more likely to get the kidney disease. So you can clearly see that there's a lot of issues out there that we need to address for Aboriginal people. And there is this thing called closing the gap that the government has made. Um, you need to probably read it for one of your HKS pre readings. I'd recommend reading through it, but it will just talk about a lot of goals that the government will try to achieve, but many haven't been achieved yet. So next slide. So going to talk, now we're going to talk about historical like past about the Aboriginals and the non-Indigenous people and how kind of this led to the health disparities now. So there's four parts, displacement, segregation, assimilation, and basically current generation ongoing structural discrimination. And this is very important for you to know because a lot of the issues now that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have, have arise from one of these kind of four historical issues. And you need to understand that you need to know these and make sure you accept how Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders might have these misunderstandings or might not even be misunderstandings, might be just true facts. And you might need to make sure you understand that you need to be careful and be always cautious of what you are doing with your actions when you're treating Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander patients. So we'll talk about some, so next slide. So displacement, so I'm pretty sure hopefully everyone knows, um, Europeans came in and colonized Australia. And because of this, new diseases were introduced and the indigenous people, they weren't, the immune system weren't built to cope with some of the diseases that they brought in. So that led to a complete wipe of many Aboriginal communities. Also the land thief basically that we did, no treaty, so they just kind of stripped of their land. They also were introduced addictive substances. So they were now a lot of um, Aboriginal people were introduced with alcohol, caffeine, smoking, drugs. And that's something that in a way has continued to this day. And also obviously the violence and killings of Aboriginal people. So as you can see, there's a lot of things that Aboriginal people we've seen or have heard of and know of so they won't trust the Western culture and Western medicine. So you need to make sure you understand that there's this history behind it. Um, next slide. And there's the segregation. You don't need to know roughly the years, you just need to know which color comes first. Um, so during this time, the government separated the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders into settlements and missions. So basically they were trying to kill them off by themselves because they had diseases and they were scared that the diseases would re-enter the European com communities. So this resulted in Aboriginals losing a lot of their freedom, custody of the children, the culture, language, and even names. So again, this is 
another thing that Aboriginal people will always have in the back of their mind when they you know, encounter someone that isn't Aboriginal, especially when it comes to Western medicine. So there's going to be this disbelief and you need to make sure you know this as well. Next slide. And then there's assimilation. So hopefully you guys have heard about stolen generation. This is basically what happened during this time. They try to breed out the black. So they try to kind of get Aboriginals to marry non-Aboriginals and they called it breeding out the black. And they basically practice genocide. So very, very bad. And again, this is one of the reasons why Aboriginals will most likely have a strong disbelief for Western medicine if we are not careful with what we say and what we do. And next slide. And now currently, there's still this ongoing structural discrimination. So a lot of things has happened since the 1960s, like voting rights and just uh, general awareness of Aboriginal health and communities, but we still have a structural discrimination. And what that kind of means is we as medical practitioners, but also just in general, systems in general are basically giving a disadvantage to a particular group while assisting the dominant group so in this case a particular group would be the indigenous people and the dominant group would be the non-indigenous people and we need to make and there's this um thing where you know we might not be trying to be racist like we're not saying racist words or things like that but we're not accepting of their culture we don't understand the culture we're not taking into account that there's this cultural differences and that is still considered as structural discrimination, right? So there's a few words you need to know. It's cultural blindness. Um, this is basically ignoring the cultural differences that exist. So you're, you're kind of turning a blind eye to the cultural differences. And also cultural safety or the lack of. It's basically the lack of an attempt to tackle the structural disadvantages that exist. So. That's also one thing, and one thing that's not on the slides, but it's also miscommunication and just straight up racism, right? You know, luckily there's been a lot of awareness now, so not many people are racist anymore, but still some people are dumb and they're just completely racist. Obviously, that's going to ruin our relationship with the Aboriginal people, which, by the way, is already ruined to a point because of the historical, historical events that I just talked about. So, you know, some things you might need to consider is silence in Aboriginal cultures are completely fine. So like you could see people just not talking to each other for like many minutes and it's completely fine in, that, in their culture. So you need to understand that. And there's this thing called yawning, which is just sharing experiences to create a mutual benefit. So basically they need to talk and have these experiences shared so they can get comfortable around you. And as a doctor, if you don't, don't accept that, then the patient will never ever be comfortable with you. And they may not rock up to their appointments. They might never trust you. So they won't say all the things that they need to say for us to know so we can give them the best care and things like that. It's very important that you are always accepting of the different cultures and that you understand the reasons why they are kind of you know, not trusting us in some extent. And next slide. So these are some of the issues that we need to really address and that the Closing Gap program is also trying to address and this education, living conditions, you know, vocational training, access to high quality fresh food, medical, better medical treatment, um, better coordinated programs, <clears throat> cultural safety as we talked about, and improved communication between healthcare workers and patients. So you will see that uh, there's a lot of Aboriginal liaison officers around in hospitals. So they're trying to make sure the Aboriginals feel safe among, among uh, when, sorry, when they come into a clinic because you know, they might not want to be there if there is no Aboriginal people. They might feel like they're kind of like not accepted. Also having uh, Aboriginal flags on you, painting behind you, playing some Aboriginal music, just doing things to make sure that you tell them we are accepting you instead of not doing anything. Because even though we might not be doing anything, that might, it, it might be like, oh, that's not racist but we're not also accepting them. And we have to show that we are accepting you by doing these things. Um, also improve communication between healthcare workers in hospitals and GP settings. Like for example, improve follow-up, like maybe an Aboriginal person doesn't turn up to a um, follow-up. Don't just be like, oh yeah, that's what they normally do. Maybe call up, call them up, see why they're not coming. Maybe they're scared because they don't have an, we don't have an Aboriginal person in 
um, the clinic and they want to talk to someone who you know, is from their community, then you have to kind of make sure you address that issue instead of just being like, oh, she'll be here or he'll be here one day. Yeah, so that's all. Just make sure that these are really important because you'll be coming across Aboriginal people for sure in your clear time. So it's very important that you know these. Yep, that's all. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll be going over some anatomy this week with you guys. Uh, okay. Next slide, thank you. Yeah, so we'll be looking at um, connective tissue this week, mainly. Uh, sorry, David, um, I've just made some changes um, at the very end, so you might need to stop sharing and sort of like re-enter the presentation. That's okay. No, you should tell me when to do that. Yeah, easy. Um, I think um, maybe best to just do it at the start. Yeah, I agree. So I'll stop share. Um, I'm going to go to the slides. I'm going to refresh. Is it in an unpublished still? Yeah. Okay, so all good. I'll go back here. This is our last presentation for the day. Unpublished. Um, I'll just sl slide to the bottom. Can you see if it's um, fixed? Yeah, all good now. It's all updated. Awesome. That's Legend. Good. Thank you so much. No, don't mention it. Yeah, so last week, David would have gone over epithelium with you guys. Um, so here we're continuing with the series. So uh, as part of the tissue types, we'll be looking at um, epithelium, connective tissue, um, muscle, and also nervous tissue. Next slide, thanks. Um, so what is connective tissue? So it's one of four basic tissue types, and it forms the framework of the body and it serves to connect separate tissues and organs together. And tissue just basically means a coherent grouping of cells bound by cell junctions or ECM. Um, and connective tissue serves, serves a few important functions. First of all, offers strength, support, and elasticity, um, serves as a biological packing material. So for example, your fat cells, they're actually a type of connective tissue, um, exchange of metabolites, and we'll also be looking at some specialized connective tissue, uh, which includes bone and stuff. Um, so this slide is um, pretty high yield and it's very important to um, take a moment to understand this. So here we're looking at the components of connective tissue. So to start off with, we have specialized cells. Um, so these could be chondrocytes, osteocytes, we'll go into more depth later. And we also have extracellular matrix, okay? So a characteristic of connective tissue is um, an abundant extracellular matrix. And in turn, it's made up of two things. We have a ground substance and different types of fibers. Next slide. Um, so let's go into the fibers, first of all. Um, so the main ones are really, collagen and elastic fibers. We don't really encounter reticular fibers that much. Um, so collagen, also known as type one and type two collagen, its properties include high tensile strength. It's very tough, flexible, it's inelastic, um, and it has a super helix structure. So examples of where you can find collagen fibers um, is in connective tissues such as ligaments, tendons, and vasculature. And last, uh, Elastic fibers, the main difference is that elastic fibers are able to stretch up to 1.5 times their length. And um, here you'll find them in um, body systems where you require expansion. So for example, your skin, your lungs, when you're breathing, your ear, and also your vasculature as well. Finally, we have reticular fibers, which are also known as type three collagen. Um, it's sort of a delicate mesh and allows for cell adherence. Um, it's found in the liver and also cell-rich areas. But once again, we don't really um, look at reticular collagen, uh, type 3 collagen that much. Okay, and so if you remember, so the extracellular matrix, we've got both fibers and ground substance. Well, what is ground substance? So its components include proteoglycans, we also have glycoproteins. We also have um, 
electrolytes, hormones and gases, and glycoaminoglycans. What a word. And the function is it serves to fill the spaces between the cells and fibers and provide sort of this um, solution in which nutrient supply and exchange of molecules can occur and also provides mechanical support as well. So if we you can see in these diagrams, you can see our fibers, these sort of like thick lines which are running um, across the images. And we also have our ground substance, which is the fluid that fills all of the space. And we also have our specialized cells. So as you can see, the extracellular matrix to cell ratio um, is very high. There's a lot of extracellular matrix. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so onto the specialized cells. So depending on the type of connective tissue, we'll have different types of cells. So for example, in cartilage, we have chondroblasts, um, and we also have lipoblasts in um, fatty tissue, and we also have osteoblasts in bone, we have fibroblasts, um, and that serves to sort of produce all the collagen and our fibers in our connective tissue. And we also have myoblasts, which lead to skeletal muscle, but um, that's a different tissue type, which we'll be covering in future. Next slide, please, David. Okay, so what are the types of connective tissue? Um, so broadly speaking, they can be categorized into either proper or specialized connective tissue. And within proper, we have loose and dense connective tissue. And some specialized connective tissue includes uh, bone, cartilage, and blood is actually a type of connective tissue. Yep. So let's look at um, the first type of proper connective tissue, which is loose connective tissue. Um, so some properties, it has abundant ground substance, so lots of that uh, liquid gel-like substance. The fibers are loosely packed, um, and the function is to hold substances in place. So for example, your fat cells help to hold the fat in place. And examples include your adipose tissue and your breast tissue as well. Yeah, and second type of proper connective tissue is dense connective tissue. So these um, include uh, fewer cells and the fibers are much, the fibers are much more dense compared to loose connective tissue. And the main purpose is to provide strength. So we have two types of dense connective tissue. One is regular, the other is irregular. So with regular, as the name suggests, the fibers are aligned in parallel. So in the first image, as you can see, it's a very ordered structure. All the fibers are running in parallel. Um, and the effect that this has is that it maximizes strength and resistance to stretch in one direction. So if you imagine you try to stretch that regular connective tissue, it's not really going to budge. Um, uh, in contrast with the irregular connective tissue, um, it's really a mesh-like structure. The fibers are irregular. They sort of go in um, all directions. So this means that um, when you sort of pull on it, um, it enables it to sort of, um, yeah, so it provides strength in multiple directions, basically, not just one. And so you see this in arteries, where sort of your arteries are expanding in all directions. Yeah. And so those are our two proper connective tissue types. So now let's look at the first specialized connective tissue, which is cartilage. So this is quite um, high yield. So we have three types of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. So very importantly, um, cartilage is avascular and aneural, meaning it doesn't have good blood supply and it doesn't have no supply. So what this means is that it has poor regeneration. Um, secondly, it also is very strong, flexible, and it resists compression. That's because it has a really abundant extracellular matrix. So you have a lot of that fluid there, which can act as a buffer to any force. And so the composition of cartilage, so we have our specialized cell, the chondrocyte, 
We have an abundant extracellular matrix. We have irregular collagen fibers and also proteoglycans, which is in that brown substance. Yeah. So here's a little table comparing the three types of cartilage. So hyaline cartilage is the most common in the body. It's strong, resists compression and flexible. Where you find hyaline cartilage is in joint surfaces, um, your costal cartilages, which is um, the cartilage connecting your ribs to your sternum, and also your respiratory cartilage. Second type is fibrocartilage. Um, we have dense collagen fibers there, um, resists considerable compression, and also has high tensile strength. Um, so mainly find fibrocartilage along your midline, and by that I mean sort of like in your spinal cord, so with your meniscus and annulus fibrosis. And uh, finally, we also have elastic cartilage. So the main difference here is that um, we have elastic fibers. So if you remember, they can stretch um, up to 1.5 times their normal length. So it's flexible, elastic, and we find this in the external ear and auditory tubes. Yep, and so this is just an example. So um, you'll find hyaline cartilage between the articulations of your bones. Um, so they allow the bones to sort of glide over each other nice and smoothly. And also um, helps to, yeah, once again, resist um, and reduce the force of impact because they sort of resist compression. Okay, so moving on to our next specialized connective tissue, we have bones. So bones count as a type of connective tissue, even though it's quite different from um, the other types that we have seen so far. Um, and so you'll note there's two types of bones. We have compact and trabecular. So on this diagram, so the compact bit is where it's very solid on the side and trabecular is where it has a honeycomb structure. So um, lots of empty space. In contrast to cartilage, bone is vascular and neural. So it has good regenerative properties. So basically when you break a bone, uh, the doctor puts it in a cast and if you immobilize it, after a few weeks, it should be able to heal itself. And so it's strong, solid, sturdy, and this trabecular structure um, also makes a lightweight as well. And so it resists compression and is slightly flexible. So what actually gives bone this sort of solid structure as opposed to the other forms of connective tissue that we've seen? So once again, we have our specialized cell, which is the osteocyte in this case. We have organic, and importantly, we also have inorganic extracellular matrix with bone, and that's what causes it um, to uh, look very solid. So we have organic collagen fibers, and the inorganic component includes um, hydroxyapatite and also calcium phosphate crystals. So, um, that's what gives bone its strong, solid properties. Yeah, and so looking at the first type of bone, compact bone, so it's solid and it's dense. And um, let's briefly go over the structure. So bones are organized into osteons, basically these cylinders. Um, so these um, osteons, right? So they, at the center, as you can see, we have some um, veins, arteries, and neurovasculature. And then surrounding it, we have um, these different layers. So that's what we call lamellae, and they're concentric. So they're going around in layers. And so within these layers, um, we can see our osteocytes. Um, so osteocytes, they're sort of scattered throughout in between these layers. And uh, yeah, like I said, the neurovascular supply runs um, throughout the center of these osteons. Next slide, please. Yep, and they can also, the neurovasculature supply can also run perpendicular as well to sort of cross from one osteon to the other. And we can see our lamellae in, uh, in the right cutout and also our small osteocytes there as well. So that's compact. Uh, next, looking at trabecular bone. So properties compared to compact bone, it's more lightweight. 
And you see in this empty space um, actually contains red marrow, which is uh, mostly consists of hemopoietic stem cells, which are sort of your precursors um, to red blood cells. Structure is honeycomb. And um, even though it may look very random, the structure, um, it actually is denser where there is more stress. So some places in the trabecular brain, you can see um, more dense areas and other areas with more uh, empty space. Yeah, and this is just to give you a big overview. So this is a long bone. So at the top, we can see our uh, trabecular bone. Um, so it contains red marrow. Then as we go down uh, the shaft, the sides of our bone are compact bone. And you'll also notice that we have articular cartilage. And so that's um, actually the um, hyaline cartilage that we were talking about. So we've got sort of two types of connective tissue here. And we've got some questions to finish off. Um, so if you guys want to put this into the chat, what are the three main components of connective tissue? or list as many as you can. Yeah, fantastic. So we have the specialized cells, we have our extracellular matrix, and which includes the fibers and ground substance. Yeah, fantastic. Next. Yeah, so as you can see here, we have our specialized cells, ECM, and the ground substance and fibers. Next slide, please. Um, and yeah, so what is true of regular dense connective tissue? Yep, people are saying, see, yeah, that's right. So regular dense connective tissue maximizes strength and resistance to stretch in one direction. So all the other options, they're um, irregular connective tissue. Next slide. Sorry, I think there's like some piano music in the background. That's my brother practicing. <laughs> um, and yes, for this one, there's... Uh, more than one true answer. So select all and uh, all the options that are true. Yep, great stuff, Daniel. So um, A and D. So an important thing to remember here is that um, vascular uh, neurovasculature. Uh, determines the regenerative capacity. So if it's avascular and aneural, which is cartilage, it's going to have poor regenerative capacity. And if it's vascular and neural like bone, it's going to have good regenerative capacity. Right. And so that's everything from me.